I love that we have been in the book of Joshua in these weeks, and I'll tell you why. Because in a very real way, I think I feel a bit like Joshua. The reason I think I feel like Joshua is because, well, I'm old enough now that I can carry in my memory the whole collective history of Faith Bridge, 20 years worth. But I'm still young enough and energetic enough that I have excitement and energy about the things God has in store for us as we move into the future, taking our next steps. And they're exciting steps. The plans that God's been giving us are marvelous plans. They've been in the works for a year, year and a half, maybe two years now with important feedback that came all along from the congregation. It's a project which is going to finally get us space that's adequate for our thriving youth ministry that has three to 500 youth every weekend now, still currently operating up in the loft. That's their offices and their hub, the building that, the, the, the part of the building that was designed for them back when we were in the school Um, years ago, 14, 15 years ago, space for our road missions ministry, a beautiful chapel that will be suitable for those special occasions that life brings, those moments where you need a bit more of a sacred space, like a wedding or a funeral or an infant dedication or renewal of marriage vows. It'll have a beautiful baptistry out front and adult classroom space, which we've never had, so that we can offer next step classes for adults that want to take their next step in discipleship on Sundays, as well as finally completing, putting in the final segment of our parking uh, scheme that was master planned for us back near the turn of the century, and we'll finally have it in. I'm so excited about it, and, and I think in that regard, um, I, I, well, I just, I guess I feel a bit like Joshua even there, because I can see it. I can see the, the promised land, the sort of things that we've talked about and dreamed about for years, and years. As a matter of fact, I, I, maybe I went a little bit too far, but the other day I just felt prompted the Holy Spirit to come over here and pray. I think it was Thursday or Friday morning. And in the spirit of Joshua, I decided, well, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go around that area, back in that, that gravel area seven times, and I'm just going to pray about it for seven times. Or, and I was going to walk it, but it was so cold, I decided I'd do a prayer drive. So I, I drove it. <laughs> <laughs> seven times. And along around about the fourth or the fifth time, I, I looked up and there was a cop sitting in his car. And I'm thinking, how am I going to explain this exactly? So when he asked, what's your name? I said, well, of course, I'm Pastor Dan Slagle. And sometimes I just do random things like, no, that part didn't really happen. He stayed in his car and I just kept driving and, and praying. And, and then finally after seven, I just waved and went on my way. But as I've been considering Joshua and the things that he was feeling, it's occurred to me that I, I feel similar in yet another way. And that is, of course, Joshua had, had taken over and had led God's people right up to the banks of the Jordan River. And they could see across that river to the promised land, as I can and as you can look over and you can see it. But there was something that was in between, and that was the Jordan River. 
which is not one of the great rivers of the world. It's not the Nile, it's not the Amazon, it's not even the Mississippi. It's actually a rather small river, and some of you have been there. You've been to the Holy Land. Some of you have even been in the Jordan River, even been baptized in it. And so you know it's not an overwhelming river, except the Bible says at this point, it was during flood stage, during harvest, when things ticked up for the Jordan River about two months every year. And if you've ever been near a flooding river or ever watched footage of a flooding river on TV, you know you don't want to step into that flooding river, and you certainly don't want to let your little kids get near a flooding river, lest they be swept away. And I guess I feel similar to Joshua in that we have a bit of a river standing in between what we see and where we are right now. And it's a river about ten and a half million dollars wide. <laughs> um, but what I want to do in the next few minutes is go back in our story of Joshua, feeling prompted by the Holy Spirit that was previously planning on moving us ahead. And I felt like I said, I want you to go back to this text. It's a portion that we sort of passed over but didn't lean into several weeks ago. And I felt like he said, why don't you go back and focus on these words. And so I want to read to you what happened when Joshua and his people got to the edge of the flooding Jordan River. It says, now then, Choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. And yet, as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. And it piled up in a heap a great distance away. And the priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. And in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You'll tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. It's a fascinating story, and one which I'm sure caught the people off guard back there in Joshua's time. Because I would imagine that they who had heard the stories of Moses and what had happened 39 years prior <coughs> when they would cross the Red Sea 39 years prior because Moses was instructed by God, hold out your staff and I'm going to part the waters. And they would go across. I suspect that they were thinking, well, I suppose Joshua's going to hold out his staff and here we're going to do it. We've heard about what happened to our forefathers. But that's not what God told them to do this time. He was going to give them a different instruction. No less miraculous, though, but very counterintuitive. He said, I want the 12 priests who were holding the Ark of the Covenant. That was big and heavy on their shoulders. They're going to lead the way, and then I want them to step into the water. Now, that's a vulnerable position stepping into flooding water while you're holding something heavy over your heads. Very counterintuitive. And then the miracle happens, and they all go across. And then God says, build a monument. 
right here where you came across. In scripture, you see these stone monuments sometimes. They were called Ebenezer's. There's these memorials in time that, that just help bring us back in our memories to what happened. I'll tell you three reasons I believe that God told them to build an Ebenezer. The first reason is because we tend to forget. All of us tend to forget. We have these high spiritual moments with God along the way in our lives, but if we're not careful, our memories grow dim and we forget about those things and we get busy in the every days of life and that's why God is into symbols. That's why he's into helping us access those memories. That's why you look in Deuteronomy 6 and you read about the phylacteries that they would tie upon themselves. That's why he gave a symbol or a, or, or a marker to help Noah after the flood. Do you remember the sign that he gave to him? What was that sign? He gave them the rain, gave him the rainbow. Why did he give him a rainbow? Because don't you know that Noah was forever going to instinctively, impulsively reach for the hammer and wood every time he felt a trickle of raindrops coming out of the sky. And it was as if when God gave the rainbow, he was saying, no, no, you can just grab the umbrella because I've given you a promise. That was a once and only once time until the final judgment. That's why Jesus, he, he was into symbols and the night before he was betrayed, before he went to the cross, what did he do? He took the bread and he took the, the cup and he broke the bread and he said, now, I want you to remember what I'm going to do for you tomorrow. Even as this bread has been broken, my body's going to be broken on the cross for you. And my blood's going to be poured out for you. And I want you to remember that every time you come back together so you don't forget, why are we here? It's because I came to live the life of sinlessness that you couldn't live. Or, yeah, sinlessness, and perfection that you couldn't live. So that I would be fit and suitable as a sacrifice to die as your punishment, as your substitute. And why did he give us the symbol of baptism? So we could remember when we got saved. That in the same way that Jesus on the third day rose from the grave, that we too who are linked to him by faith, we too are raised to life. Life abundant now and everlasting eternally. That's why Jesus was into symbols. God's always been into symbols because accessing our memories is a very important part of discipleship. It's why we wear crosses. It's why many of us who wear one of these kind of rings, we wear it to remind us about the day that we married our best friend so that we don't ever forget that. I think that's the first reason that God said, I want you to build an Ebenezer because I don't want you to forget what I did right here in your life. I think there's a second reason. The second reason is because I want you to remember it's not all about you. There's another generation that's coming along after you. A new generation that will come after you and a new generation after them. And when they pass by this Ebenezer, they're going to say, Dad, Granddad, what's the meaning behind those stones anyhow? And you're going to be able to tell them. Oh, I'll tell you the story of what God did. Because there's a new generation that needs to hear the stories of faith. It builds faith into them. My boys, Wesley and William, I've noticed over the years, they, they enjoy, as all your children do, they enjoy hearing stories. But there's one or two stories they recurringly ask me to tell. And those are stories of the earliest days of Faith Bridge, like when we couldn't get into the Klein Independent School District. They told us, you don't qualify, you're too small, you don't have enough money, and you don't own any property, and we can't rent our school to you. But we prayed, and we prayed, and, by, and we prayed, and by one thing and another, I 
roundaboutly had a phone call from Dr. Collins, who was the superintendent, who had a big heart and said, I think we could grant you an exception. And it was because of the praying that we'd been doing. We saw God move. It was a miracle. And my boys love hearing the story of when we came out here praying on this land, when it was a farm owned by Leonard Binfer back in the day, and we were praying, God, we're just a little church, and this this is going to cost a couple million dollars to get this land. And and should we do it? Are, Are we doing the right thing? And then God sent this man named Paul, who would start a restaurant called Paul's Pizza, running down Steubner Airline that morning, and he didn't know us, and we didn't know him, but he just felt like God said, I need to go and tell them something. So he came up and he said, I know this is weird, we don't know each other, but I'm just going to tell you, I feel like God gave me a word to tell you. I feel like God told me to tell you, this land is going to be your land, and you're going to build a house of prayer here. And every time I tell those stories to my boys, I look into their eyes, and I can tell what's going on. They're muscles of faith are growing stronger and they're daring to believe in their own souls. Well, if something like that could happen in your life, dad, then maybe God will do something like that in our lives as well. There's another generation that's coming along after us. And I believe that's the second reason that that God said, I want you to leave this marker so they'll ask, what's that about? Because we can forget, can't we? We can forget there's another generation. I was reminded, I guess it was about a month ago, I got the most wonderful letter from a young lady in our church. I remember when she and her sisters were little girls, and they were uh, the Glass girls that belonged to Kyle and Liz Glass, uh, back at the Cleb Intermediate School, but she now is, is grown and married and has three of her own, and she wrote me the kindest note about a month ago, and I'm going to read it to you, uh, and I got her permission to read it. She said, Pastor Ken, my husband Billy and I, we attended the legacy meeting last Friday night, and I wanted to come speak with you afterwards, but I didn't want to interrupt the conversation you were having, so I decided to send you an email instead just to give you our feedback. First of all, I started going to Faith Bridge when we got a postcard in the mail about an Easter service some 20 years ago. I remember that mail card. It featured you wearing a denim shirt, and it said, come to church just as you are. That's when my family began attending church every Sunday, routinely, for the first time in our lives. And from that point on, my faith journey began. And while I've never been super outgoing, I always listened and soaked up everything my youth pastor, Ben Stewart, was teaching us every week. And I remember when we went to cross camp in high school and my time at Faith Bridge in high school really impacted my future. I even invited some of my friends to come, including Billy, to come with me too because I knew Faith Bridge was something special. And after we got married, we benefited from several marriage studies and then once we started having kids, the mom's group became a big part of my weekly routine and we moved away to Midland a couple of years ago knowing that when we moved back, we wanted to move closer to Faith Bridge so that our kids would be able to get to church quickly for Bible studies on weeknights and all the wonderful kids' ministry and student ministry programs the church offers. My kids love attending Faith Bridge. Seriously, they would go to a third service if you gave them the option. (laughs) They're so excited to go every week, and they love attending. Just this past week, I was carrying my three-year-old upstairs to put him to bed. I hadn't turned on the light yet, and he told me he was a little scared. I told him, don't worry, and that I was with him. And without pausing, he said, and God is always with me too, so I don't have to be scared. Such profound words from my three-year-old. After we attended the legacy gathering last week, I felt even more confident in our kids growing up here. I left feeling incredibly excited about Faithbridge's future and the gift that the student ministry is going to offer to my kids now. The meeting far exceeded our expectations. It really is going to be amazing. Faith Bridge is so much more than a church. It's community. It's growth. It's home. And Faith Bridge has blessed us more than you could ever know over the years. And I'm so thankful for it. Melanie. Isn't that a sweet note? Yeah. I tell you, I... 
I read it several times, and it just made my week. And because I'm no different than you are, from time to time, all of us wonder, am I making any difference, really? And it was as if God said through a note that he prompted Melanie to write, yes, but remember, the difference you're making is about a new generation. You're making a legacy for them at this point. I think that's the second reason that God had them build that Ebenezer. One last one. One last reason, and that is this. I believe God had them to construct that stone monument because he wanted them to never forget what triggered the miracle, what initiated it, what had to happen first, without which it wasn't going to happen, and that is those 12 priests were going to step into the water, something that would have seemed crazy, totally counterintuitive. You want us to step into a flooding water holding this big precious ark of the covenant of God? That's crazy, but they did it. And I wondered what must it have been like to be a child, to be a son or a grandson of one of those priests and one day to say, Dad or Granddad, what did it feel like that day when you stepped into the flooding water? And to hear him say, oh, son of mine, grandchild of mine, I'll tell you, it felt crazy, risky, terrifying. But in the same moment, it became exhilarating, inspiring, unforgettable, transformational. In fact, son, I remember the moment the waters came over my ankles and praying, oh God, I hope that Joshua really heard loud and clear from you right about now. But the moment I felt the waters come around my feet and my ankles is it was as if I heard the loudest clap of thunder ever from heaven. Pow! And I looked over and all of us looked over and you could see nothing, but it was as if a dam had dropped from heaven and God had shut the waters off and the last of the waters flowed through and within a few seconds, it was down to just a little trickle like going down the drain. And it was in that moment we realized this isn't a miracle like we've heard about that happened to Moses or that we've read about that happened to Abraham. This is a miracle that God is actually inviting us to step into. We get to be a part of it ourselves. And ever since that day, son, Whenever I come by this stone monument, I feel the whisper of the Holy Spirit remind me, never stop stepping out in faith because that's where the miracles are initiated. This morning, we're going to step out ourselves in faith. We're going to step out and we're going to build a legacy for those who are coming after us. Some of us, we won't have kids anymore, as you heard in the McDowell video, who will enjoy the blessings of this. Others of us, we will. And that's a marvelous thing, but it's irrelevant because finally the day will come when all of us have moved on, but there will be vibrant things happening here in the name of the Lord because of what happened today. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment because we've got to cross this river. As you heard a little bit ago, the river is about $10.5 million wide. But it got a lot narrower a couple of weeks ago. We had a gathering with about 130 families. And they stepped in first. And they made commitments that totaled $6.5 million, which 
narrowed the gap substantially to 4 million. That's the good news. Praise the Lord and thank you to those who were here that night. Now, the not so good news is that most of us who are here today uh, probably uh, don't have the earning capacity that some of those people have. And, and subsequently, most of us are going to be making pledges not in the 50 or the 75,000 or 100 or more thousand dollar level, although there's a few of you here and you weren't able to come and you said, we're going we're to show up with strength, don't worry. And so you have your moment, but most of us, I, I'm talking to most of us, and most of us here today, to make a commitment above and beyond our normal offerings, totaling as much as $15,000 over the next 26 months, that's huge. Or 10000 that's huge. 5000 that feels huge. 2500 that feels huge. About 100 extra a month for the next 26 months, that feels huge to any number of us. But every step counts. That's how we're going to cross this together. Linking arms and stepping together. Some of you who've never taken part in a moment like this, you say, how, how do you do this? I mean, we never did this. Like, how are people doing this? Well, I'll tell you just... In general terms, I won't call any names, but I could call several names of families that have said, well, one way that we're going to do there, get there is, is we were going to get a new car because we, we, this one needs to be replaced, but we've decided, you know what, it'll go two more years. We'll just push that out two more years, and we'll just drive this one a little bit longer. I think of another family that said, you know, we eat out a lot. It's a big family. We eat out all the time. Dad said to me, we were just calculating, goodness, if we just ate out one night less per week over the course of 26 months, that'd be several thousand dollars that we could push into this. What are people doing in so saying? They're saying, you know what? A car or a meal out, it's not as important as what's going to happen here. For years to come, for hundreds and eventually thousands of people who will come through those doors and hear the gospel and be transformed. I think of uh, yet another example of a person <coughs> who told me last week, she's a young adult, she's in our uh, common room ministry. She said, Pastor Ken, I'd like your, just to talk to you a moment. Yes. She said, I, I wanted to tell you the process that I'm going through for legacy. I said, okay. She said, I, I'm a college student and I don't, I only do a little part-time nannying. So at present I give roughly $20 a month. That's, that's what I can do for the normal offerings. She said, but I've been, I've been trying to figure out, okay, God, what do you want me to do during legacy for those 26 months? And as best I can figure, I think if I move this around and do that, I think I could do another $20 a month on top of that. I was like, that's amazing. And that's sacrificial. That's like $500. She said, I may not be able to get all the way there. It may be like 15. I'm like, well, I just appreciate your heart because it reflects exactly what we've been talking about in this season. You remember the three R's? We've talked about, all of us tend to start at what's reachable. What's attainable? You, what do you want? That's like when you're coming out of Kroger's and the girls say, do you want some Girl Scout cookies? And you're like, eh, sure, I'll take a couple boxes. You hadn't planned on it, but you don't have to pray about it and think about it or move anything around. You're like, sure, here. That's what's reachable. But we won't hit the goal if all of us just do what's reachable. The second R is the reprioritizing R where we say, actually, I'm going to move some things around, and I'll just push that out for two years, and we'll do this instead. And then there's that third R, relying. And that's the R that I was really thinking of when she told me her story last Sunday. You're really relying on God. Uh, Suzanne and I were talking last night, and we 
thought of a couple of families whom we know and love and pray for. And, and both in those families, both of the, the primary breadwinners have cancer. And they're both men, and they both have told me directly, I just want you to know, notwithstanding all that's going on, we're, we're going to be in on this. I'm like, that's so humbling because you're relying on God. And it's a beautiful thing. I'm going to ask us all to take a step today, a step of faith. In a moment, the ushers are going to give you um, a, a little packet. Let me tell you what they're going to give you so that you can anticipate it when it comes. They're going to give you something that looks like this. It's a pledge card and a pen and then a little sticker. It's like a seal. If you want to seal it um, after you're done, then you can do that. And at the very end, in both rooms, we're going to bring our, our cards forward. But you'll hear more about that uh, when it's time. Let me show you what the, the front of the card looks like. Since we don't talk about money much, we don't do things like this often. It's been six years since we had a, a campaign like this. Here's what the card will look like. On the left side, we put our basic information, and then on the right side, it's a place for you to do some tabulating and saying, okay, we've got a little bit of 19 left, 20, 21, and we'll touch down in 22. That's important for some people whose tax advisors had said it would be advantageous for them to spread their giving out over four tax years. Our intention is to go about a month, maybe two or three for those that need the spring months because that's when bonus structures are of 2022, and then we'll be done with this. And what I'm going to ask you to do is, is to, uh, you do the tabulating and you write in to that spot, here's what God's calling us to do. Everybody's going to have their own number based upon their own circumstances, based upon their own nudgings from the Holy Spirit. To help you, on the other side, there's a, a matrix, and that's the matrix that we started with. Uh, that our consultant Greg gave us. He said, here's just a model of how this could come about. Of course, people give in round numbers, uh, uh, all in between those concrete numbers based upon their circumstances, but this just gave us an idea. Now, as you've already heard a time or two today, um, that river was substantially narrowed several weeks ago. So we, we have a new matrix, and we're going to put that one up, and that's the $4 million matrix. As you'll see, we still do need a few people who are at the top, and some of you have said, we're going to be there, don't worry, we couldn't come to the dinner that night, but we're going to be there on the 17th, and I need you to come through. But most of us, as I've said, the, I think the overwhelming majority of us today are going to be in the, in the lower categories, somewhere in there. And every single gift matters. Every single gift counts. Since the cards were printed several weeks ago before we had this new uh, chart and they printed the old chart, we're just going to leave the new chart up because some people said last week it would help us if we could see monthly increments. Like what would this be a month for 26 months? So we did that math just to help you do some calculating um, as well. So in a moment, I'm going to pray, and the ushers then are going to come in both rooms, and they're going to give you these cards, and the musicians will come in both sides and give you a few moments just to uh, do some calculating and leaning into whoever you're with. If you're with someone, praying about that. Many of you have already come kind of having done some prayer and thought about that already. And then in both rooms, Pastor Dan, I should say, uh, is going to guide you in the communion service. Um, and so in that venue, after I pray, you'll go with Pastor Dan, and he'll give you instruction. And those of you in the live venue, I'll continue to give you instruction when it's time to come forward. And we're going to bring our cards and put them in these uh, bowls uh, at the base of the Ebenezer. So let me pray for us now. Lord, thank you for the chance that you give us to step into a miracle and be part of the miracle. Thank you, God, for 20 rich years of ministry 
and for 20 yet to come, and more beyond that still, for the lives that will be changed and the souls that will be saved, for the, the powerful things that you've done and will continue to do. Now, Lord, this is a step of faith moment for us, and these moments can be trepidatious because they feel counterintuitive. We like to feel totally in control. And sometimes when we step out on faith, we're having to trust. And yet that's what you've always called us to in the first place. God, won't you give us trust to respond to the nudgings that you're giving to us, each of us in our own souls? Lord, I pray particularly for those that are a little bit resistant. They say, I don't like to fill out a card. I don't want to fill out a card. Why do you not want to fill out a card? Because I don't believe in making commitments uh, that I might not be able to do. And yet, Lord, <laughs> we're doing it all the time. We fill out a commitment card with our power company. We fill out our commitment card with a cell phone company. We fill out commitment cards with our mortgage company. And it's really something that we're very accustomed to doing, doing. Forgive us, Lord, for drawing back when it involves you. Won't you give us extra trust and faith to consider the reality that if you're nudging us, prompting us that you'll meet us in that and that if something changes along the way that we can adjust that card and that there's plenty of grace and sometimes there's surprise on the good end and people can adjust in that direction and so we'll just leave it in your hands but knowing that we have to have collectively the uh, the confidence that we can move forward fiscally, responsibly, conservatively. We need to have this number. Won't you do a miracle even now in our midst? And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.